that there's not a single person that morning on his ferry who sees that crash and says, you know what, this just kind of seems like it's going to be a weird day. I think I might go work from home for the rest of the day. Instead, everyone proceeds on into New York, assuming that this is just the kind of weird stuff that happens in New York. And you see that across the country. You see that reaction on Capitol Hill. Brian Gunderson, the chief of staff to House Majority Leader Dick Armey, he talks about walking into the office that morning. And every congressional office has a TV in the reception area playing cable news. And that morning, the crash happened at 846. It was the final minutes of the morning shows. Most TV channels were live, carrying the burning footage of the World Trade Center by 849, three minutes later. So Brian Gunderson walks in to his office that morning to go to his 9 a.m. staff meeting, sees the World Trade Center on fire, and proceeds into his meeting. He says, I thought it was going to be like a bad school shooting the type of thing that dominates national news but doesn't fundamentally change anyone's day. In Florida, President Bush gets word of the attack and talks to his national security advisor, Condi Rice, back at the White House. They talk about what a weird crash it is. They have the same reaction that effectively everyone in America had that morning. It was probably a small plane. Maybe the pilot had a heart attack. Maybe the plane was having mechanical problems. Maybe it was an air traffic control accident. It's just weird. Condi Rice goes on into her 9 a.m. staff meeting. President Bush walks into that classroom at Emma Booker Elementary School. At the FBI, Robert Mueller that was in his first week on the job as the director of the FBI. And every morning at 8 a.m., the FBI in that first week was trying to give him briefings on the FBI's biggest cases. So that morning at 8 a.m., Tuesday, September the 11th, Bob Mueller had actually sat down for his first briefing on Al-Qaeda and the bombing of the USS Cole the previous year. 49 minutes later, an aide interrupts to tell the room about the crash, and Bob Mueller, the FBI director, sitting in a briefing of, on Al-Qaeda, looks out the window and says, how on earth could a plane have hit the World Trade Center on such a crystal clear blue day? Terrorism was not the top of anyone's mind until 9.03, and that second crash. It's only then that America begins to understand that it's under attack. What you see unfold over the course of the rest of the day from there is this remarkable improvisation by regular Americans, by the military, by rescue personnel, and by the top government officials of the country all of whom find themselves tackling a crisis larger, more confusing, and scarier than anything that they had ever lived through before. And part of what is so fascinating about coming to understand how that morning unfolds is you begin to see these stories that if they had happened on any other day in modern American history, would be among the most interesting things that have ever happened in modern American history. And yet that morning don't even rank among the 10 or 12 biggest stories of the day. So there's three stories, uh, three vignettes from that morning that I wanna share uh, about sort of the remarkable work that humans, uh, that Americans did at all levels of the country. The first is the incredible reaction by air traffic controllers. I read that small chapter about the 8 a.m. hour. 
Ben Sliney, who you heard from in that chapter, he was the national operations manager. But moreover, he was actually in his first day on the job as the nation's national operations manager for the FAA. And in his first 90 minutes on the job, he gives two orders that no American has ever given before or since. After that second crash, he gives a nationwide ground stop. That, uh, that is, uh, any plane that is not yet in the air has to remain on the ground. Then at, after the crash of the third plane into the Pentagon at 9.37 that morning, he issues a second order, an unprecedented order that he's not sure that he has the legal authority to issue. Land everything, land everything now. And air traffic controllers across the country begin to put on the ground the 4,500 planes that are in the air at that moment across the country. 4,500 planes being redirected to the closest airport that they can land at, regardless of their destination and regardless of whether the airport is in any way prepared to receive them. Now, we sort of only ever hear about like, the tiny sliver of this story uh, which is the 38 planes forced down in Gander, Newfoundland, the transatlantic flights that uh, land in Newfoundland that make up the backdrop for the Broadway musical Come From Away. Uh, and that they, that those planes end up, you know, being on the ground in Newfoundland uh, for, uh, basically from Tuesday through Saturday, and a town of 9,000 people absorbs 7,000 transatlantic passengers into Gander, Newfoundland, with just a few hours and in some cases, minutes notice. Across the country, Ben Sliney and the other air traffic controllers, they put 750 planes on the ground in the first 10 minutes after that order goes out at 9.42 that morning. And over the course of the morning, sort of one of the things that you see there play out is the extent to which we didn't know that there were only the four hijacked planes. Well into the afternoon, the government believed that there might be a dozen or even two dozen hijacked airliners still in the skies above the United States or coming into the United States. That there were hijacking scares across the country, all different airlines, and that there were closures around the country related to that. They evacuated the Sears Tower in Chicago. They evacuated skyscrapers in Los Angeles. That no one really knew what came next. And so they evacuated the Prudential Center in Boston. And in Toronto, they actually closed the subway, fearing that the subway might be a target for an attack in Canada. Across the country, we just had no sense of when the attacks were over, what the next shoe to drop might be. The second story that I found so remarkable from that day is the story of the maritime evacuation of Lower Manhattan, that over the course of that morning and afternoon, this makeshift armada of pleasure yachts and fishing vessels, ferries, uh, tugboats, um, uh, rescue boats from the fire department and the police, end up improvising an evacuation of Lower Manhattan of 400,000 people. It's the largest maritime evacuation in world history, larger than the British evacuation of Dunkirk. And it's a story that most Americans have never heard at all. It's a story that on 9-11, no one really noticed at all. And yet this incredible 
civilian armada comes together to help New Yorkers trapped in Lower Manhattan by the collapse of the towers. The whole effort is overseen at the tip of Lower Manhattan by a single junior Coast Guard officer named Michael Day, as well as a team of uh, boat pilots from the Sandy Hook Benevolent Pilots Association, the people who help navigate big ships in and out of New York Harbor. Lieutenant Day talks about how he probably broke more federal laws that day than he has enforced in the totality of the remainder of his decades in the U.S. Coast Guard. But that that morning, this just team comes together, these boat captains volunteer their vessels, and in fact, even people begin breaking into the marinas around Lower Manhattan to, uh, to break out the big pleasure yachts in the marinas to rescue people and evacuate them from them. One of the things I learned in the course of this book is uh, a, a good life tip if you ever need to know. Uh, it turns out most rich people leave the keys to their boats on their boats. And so uh, they were able to empty out uh, the marinas of lower Manhattan and ferry people to safety in New Jersey, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. The third story uh, that it takes place in the bunker under the White House lawn, that 9-11 saw Dick Cheney in his office that morning. He is picked up by Secret Service agents and rushed down into what is known as the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, the PIOC. It's a bunker built after World War II by Harry Truman to protect presidents in the event of a Soviet nuclear attack on Washington. And until that morning on 9-11, it had never been used by a president before. Dick Cheney ends up assembling a war cabinet underneath the North Lawn of the White House. It is not a great facility to be trying to run an emergency response. They realize very quickly that the, they can either listen to the government video conference that's going on or listen to cable news, but not both. And so over the course of the morning, they keep having to turn down the video conference to turn up the cable news and vice versa. And that over the course of that morning, a team of government officials, including the Secretary of Transportation, including National Security Advisor Condi Rice, and a number of military aides end up filing into the PIOC. They think that there are more planes coming inbound to Washington. They know of at least one United Airlines Flight 93 and think that there might be others. The colleagues that they leave above ground at the White House, most staff evacuate, but there are two rooms that stay occupied, the Secret Service Joint Operations Center and the White House Situation Room. In both officials believe that they are probably going to die at their desks when a plane hits the World Trade, when a plane hits the White House that morning. At the FBI command post, a supervisor stands up and says, after impact, anyone who survives, go to the alternate command post and we will pick up security there. Inside the White House bunker, they actually go around the room and enter everyone's names and social security numbers into an email that they then send out of the bunker to officials at other facilities so that after the crash, after the impact on the White House, people will know, rescuers will know who was inside the bunker and who to look for as survivors. Vice President Cheney, shortly after 10 a.m., Navy Commander Anthony Barnes, former naval aviator, comes to him. He's the, Commander Barnes is the director of the White House bunker of that day. And he's on the phone with the Pentagon and he asks Vice President Cheney for authority to shoot down one of the incoming 
airliners. He understands, he's a naval aviator, he understands exactly how serious this is. So once Dick Cheney gives the authority, Commander Barnes asks a second time. He asks a third time after Dick Cheney confirms it a second time. After that third time, Dick Cheney begins to get angry and he says, of course, we have to do this. We don't have any choice. They talk about taking lives in the air in order to save lives on the ground. And that morning, what is so remarkable about the way that people feel these moments of history is that none of them realize that the attacks are actually over. That Dick Cheney doesn't have that conversation until 10, 12 to 10, 18 that morning. And that the final plane, United Airlines Flight 93, crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 10, 03. People all through that morning thought that they were changing the course of history without ever understanding that the attacks were actually already over that there was nothing that the US government did from the beginning of that attack to the end that meaningfully changed the direction of the attacks. Dick Cheney's order is translated down through the military's chain of command to two fighter pilots, Heather Penny and Mark Sassville at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington. They're scrambled into the sky and again, like the fighter pilots that I talked about in that opening chapter of the book that I read, both Heather Penny and Mark Sassville are sent into the sky unarmed. Their planes have no missiles. And they realize as they launch that they are being sent into the sky as kamikazes, that the one weapon that they are bringing with them to attack a hijacked airliner is their own plane and they will have to crash their plane into a hijacked airliner in the skies over the United States in order to end the attack. They think that they are being sent out on a one-way mission. What they don't realize is that they don't take to the air until 10.35 that morning. The entire day has been over for more than 30 minutes. And that that confusion is just indicative of how the government's response unfolded, how the human response unfolded, and how little we understood about what that day actually was as it unfolded. One of the other things that sort of comes through in tackling 9-11 as an oral history, as the story of how people experienced it, is you begin to have an understanding of 9-11 as a full sensory experience. That one of the things that we talk about, so, or the, the, one of the things we most remember about that day is the visuals. We remember the blue sky across the Northeast, which was actually a unique meteorological phenomenon known as severe clear, the result of a large storm front that moved through the Northeast on the evening of September 10th and left that brilliant blue sky, that crisp September Tuesday on the 11th. That blue is one of the defining aspects of that day, but for the people who lived 9-11, it engulfed all of their senses. And so one of the things that comes through when you begin to listen to and hear and read these stories of the survivors of that day is what 9-11 sounded like, what it tasted like, what it felt like on your skin. The people trapped in the collapse of the World Trade Center, they talk about what the winds felt like as the towers fell. They talk about the pulverized dust hitting their backs, going up their pant legs, down their shirts, at hurricane force winds. And they talk about what 9-11 tasted like, what that concrete dust filled their mouths and what that was like. They talk about it as 
wet socks. They talk about it as concrete in their mouth. And then of course, there's the silence that actually one of the most remarkable aspects of 9-11 is the extent to which across the country by the middle of the afternoon, most of the country had come to a stop. The, the airlines had been grounded and people across the country remember walking outside that afternoon and looking up into the empty sky and realizing just how quiet it was. It was something that people commented on in New York, in Boston, in Washington, and as far away in my book as Fargo, North Dakota. That silence in the afternoon was one of the defining aspects of that day. F for me, reading these stories, you begin to understand what the day was really like to experience, what it was like uh, to live that fear, that confusion, that chaos, that trauma. And it goes a long way to helping to understand how the day would unfold after 9-11, the way that the US government would react on 9-12 in October in 2002, and ultimately even with the Iraq invasion in 2003 that the US was just afraid in a way that it had never been before. These stories of these survivors for me uh, are so important to remember as we see 9-11 slip from memory into history. It's always hard to know when an apocal event begins to recede from the, from the mind, but there's a good argument that it, we should make that it's right about now, that this year marked the 19th anniversary of 9-11. College campuses are beginning to fill for the first time with students who have no memories of 9-11. That this fall's election will actually see the first voters post 9-11, that people born after September 11th will be voting for the first time in November. For the first time in American history, we are deploying American servicemen and women to wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that are older than they are. This is something that we've never seen in American history before, but that actually the children, the youngest recruits who are being deployed in the Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Air Force to Iraq and Afghanistan it's been long enough that their parents might have actually fought there in the early days of the Afghan invasion. Come home, had a child, and that child is now over there fighting. We've never seen anything like this. And the military is trying to figure out how you instill that sense of emotional connection to that day to people who are heading overseas to fight now. The New York City Fire Department, for the first time, its youngest recruits are born after the day that 343 of its members perished on 9-11. The man who is in charge of the New York City Fire Department, ushering them, those youngest recruits, into the fire service is Dan Nigro, the fire commissioner, who was the highest ranking uniformed officer to survive the collapse of the World Trade Centers on 9-11. He actually became the acting chief of the department the morning after September 11th, and now ends up 20 years later nearly as the fire commissioner. Of course, he's also had to lead the fire department through the incredible pandemic horrors of this spring. His career as chief of the department and commissioner bookended by two of the biggest, hardest moments for that department. And across the country, we are seeing this moment of 9-11 recede into memory, that a quarter of the country, a quarter of the country is now too young to remember 9-11 or was born after it. 
that Generation Z is coming into an adult world today shaped in ways big and small by 9-11, but mostly born after it. And that to me, trying to teach them, trying to teach college students like you how that day unfolded and why it matters to American history is the purpose of writing this book for me and trying to share this history with you today. And so with that, I would love to take uh, questions and talk with you a little bit more about uh, that day, its legacy, and America today. Thank you, Garrett. What a powerful and compelling reminder of what we lost and gained in an unthinkable tragedy. We'll hear more from Garrett in the Zoom webinar in a few minutes. When it begins and you have a question, please be sure to post it in the Q&A section so that it will be seen by the crew. Please keep your questions short and to the point. But first, we want to share a little bit about Beacon College. Located in downtown Leesburg, Beacon is a nonprofit liberal arts school. It is also America's first accredited college or university dedicated to educating students with learning disabilities, ADHD, dyslexia, and other learning differences. The Peterson's College Guide currently rates Beacon College the number one school for educating these students, as does bestvalueschools.com. And in the latest U.S. News and World Report annual rankings, Beacon College is rated as one of the best colleges in the southern region. Our anthrozoology program is one more thing that makes Beacon unique. The program is one of two undergraduate anthrozoology degree programs in the United States. Let's have a look. Anthrozoology is our newest major and our newest addition from a programmatic standpoint here at Beacon. This is a Bachelor's of Science program where we study and look at how humans and animals interact in many different contexts. So we look at companion animals, we look at captive wildlife, we look at conservation wildlife issues. So we don't focus on a single species uh, when we work with our students, but we look at multiple animals in multiple contexts and really prepare them for a career once they leave here working in an animal-related field of their interest and giving them you know, assets and skills that are transferable to any of the animal industries. So now what we're going to do is we're going to record the total occurrences that exist. I'm going to assign you an animal that's in this room and you're going to actually fill this out, okay? I'm going to give you a time period, okay? I will tell you when to start and I'll tell you when to stop. And you're going to record and you're going to make a tally of every time one of these behaviors occur. We are the second undergraduate institution in North America to offer this as a degree, and we're one of three in North America to offer it in total. <laughs> I got him from a rescue in Melbourne Beach, which is about three hours away from here. I'm a third year anthropology major here at Beacon College. I really love working with animals, interacting with them, and then talking to people about them, and it just, just felt right. What I can argue, though, is that the animal moved forward because of bunk. Right, I don't know why. Right, that's why I'm doing this. I'm being able to analyze it and I can go back and look at it. Right. Uh, if you say the animal remains, remains stationary. Mm -hmm. right. There's kind of a natural you know, attraction between students that have a learning disability and animals. Um, a lot of research has demonstrated that it's just kind of a natural fit and that our student population that we serve here at Beacon College really kind of identifies with animals and they really kind of share a similar bond with one another. Our students you know, and our animals just gel immediately with one another, and it's a really fantastic experience to see. For more information about the college, visit our website at beaconcollege.edu. Welcome back to the Beacon Salon Speaker Series. We are now live with journalist and author Garrett Graff. Welcome, Garrett. How are you this evening? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Well, in, in advance of the uh, Zoom q and I wanted to have a personal conversation with you a little bit about your own reflections about 9-11. 9-11, uh, of course, is one of those days in history that everybody remembers where they were. And I remember where I was. I was still a uh, reporter for the Orlando Sentinel, and I had just dropped off my son at daycare and had been listening to the radio, and nothing 
was different. There was no break in, so I knew nothing was going on until I walked into the newsroom and saw everybody gathered around the TV screen watching this tragedy. What were you doing on 9 11 and when you first found out about it? Yeah, uh, so I have a very boring and quotidian story of 9 11, um, which is, is part of what. I think makes that day so powerful for so many Americans is that the details of it are burned into our minds regardless of how boring a day it actually was. I was a junior in college. I was uh, eating breakfast in the dining hall and a friend came by the table and told me uh, and the people that I was sitting with that two planes had hit the World Trade Center. and. I had the same reaction that many Americans did that morning. Um, it, you know, it must have been a small plane, uh, probably had mechanical problems, maybe the pilot was uh, sick or injured, um, and yet the details of that morning are still intensely burned into my mind. Um, you know, I could, I haven't been back in that dining hall in 15 years now, um, 17 years probably. And I could still walk in and walk directly to the table that I was seated at that morning. I could tell you every friend that I was sitting with that morning. And I could tell you the way that my friend rested her hand on the table as she leaned over to tell us of those attacks. Um, and then, you know, later that morning, uh, I could tell you exactly where I was standing and what I was doing the first time I saw Osama bin Laden's photo on the television. And I remember just the befuddlement and the confusion for me of how everyone on TV seemed to know that this was the guy who had attacked us. And I just couldn't figure out how everyone seemed to know that this was who had launched this devastating attack on our country. And to that morning, at least, I had never heard of him. You know, how could someone this evil and this powerful be someone that I had never heard of at all? Wow. Well, let me ask you this, um, Garrett. Um, you, you spoke about how 9-11 changed America, how America was innocent before that moment. How did 9-11 change you? Well, my career uh, as a journalist has been almost entirely focused on how 9-11 rewrote the federal government. Um, you know, the major uh, the three major things that I have covered through my career, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and the intelligence community were all, you know, remade uh, and in the Department of Homeland Security created, you know, entirely in the world after 9-11. And so much of my writing over the years has been on uh, downstream implications of the decisions that we made after 9-11. You know, much of my work actually over the last five years has been focused on the Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection, um, an agency that underwent enormous growth after 9-11, uh, growth that was very poorly managed by a succession of leaders at DHS and led to an epidemic of crime and corruption within the ranks of CBP and the Border Patrol that is unparalleled in the history of U.S. law enforcement. And I, I've written about that, um, uh, you know, for, for years now as a journalist. You bring up the word uh, epidemic, and I'm wondering since we are now going through this coronavirus pandemic, do you see any parallels between 9-11 uh, and the current pandemic, whether it's how the government responded or how America has been changed? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that there are a couple of things that stand out for me, sort of one on the uh, the government side and one on the uh, uh, on the American side, sort of the American people side. Uh, on the government side, going back to what I was just saying about the about the creation of DHS, the 9/11 Commission and the various works by Congress and others to study what went wrong be before 9/11 resulted in the creation of two new entities tasked specifically with preventing the next 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And the DHS, of course, pulls together all of these Homeland Security agencies, um, some of the oldest parts of the federal government, like the U.S. Coast Guard, and entirely new agencies like uh, like TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, uh, and it, all with a goal of hardening and protecting the homeland. And then the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, or what in the government world is known as ODNI, is a, a role created after 9-11 that was meant to help coordinate the various intelligence bodies from the FBI and the CIA to uh, lesser known intelligence agencies like the NSA, the National Reconnaissance Office, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, all of the 17 different uh, US federal intelligence agencies. And we think of that, both of those as primarily counterterrorism roles, but in fact, both ODNI and DHS have a really important role in public health, that they have a critical role in observing the world and thinking about what's going on, understanding what's going on in the rest of the world. And DHS then, of course, has enormous responsibility for responding to a disaster afterwards, um, including FEMA, the agency that we sort of best know for its response to hurricanes and tornadoes. Now, what is important uh, to think of is uh, that basically both of those have been hobbled in the age of Donald Trump's presidency, that for the first 100 days that the coronavirus was loose in the world, there were no confirmed leaders atop either ODNI or DHS. And so in, in some ways, the US government's response to the next 9-11 was dramatically slowed by the, the way that both of those agencies were not functioning in the way that they were supposed to. The second aspect that really stands out to me in the pandemic, and I actually wrote uh, about this for Friday's anniversary in an essay in The Atlantic, is the extent to which grief feels so different in the age of the pandemic. That, after 9-11, there was an incredible sense of national and political unity that you saw President Bush's approval rating soar to 92%, the highest rating, uh, the highest approval rating ever measured by a, uh, a, a one of Gallup's polls. And you saw Americans join together in candlelight vigils and memorial services across the country and that there was a shared sense of grief and there was a shared sense of unity and resolve after 9-11. And of course, now in, uh, in the pandemic, what we are seeing is in some ways a much more national disaster with a much, much higher death toll. Um, it, you know, we're, we're looking at something in the neighborhood of 66 or 67 times the death toll of 9-11 uh, all across the country in every community in every state and yet the the grief of this moment in america feels more paralyzing and less galvanizing 
that it, it, it has splintered us as a country rather than united us. And, and I think that there are a number of different reasons for that. One being simply the politics of the moment, but two is the challenge of how this pandemic physically isolates us, that it, 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 the tiers are the same, but you are prohibited from hugging friends and family members, that you know, we, we cannot gather together as communities in the way that we did before in the wake of 9-11 and that this has been a uniquely stressful and isolating experience for Americans to live through this pandemic in part because there was a certain finality also to 9-11 you know by the end of that day we knew that that was the end of 9-11 Whereas we certainly didn't know what came next, but we didn't expect that uh, uh, we would see sort of a 9-11 occur every three days for the rest of, 20, uh, of 2001. Whereas, you know, part of the challenge of grieving in this moment is we don't know how this pandemic will unfold, that there are... 100,000 Americans alive today, a population the size of South Bend, Indiana, who will not be alive by most measurements uh, by the end of this year because of the pandemic. I mean, that's a tremendous death toll, a tremendous impact on families all across the country that we have yet to live. And, and you can sort of imagine how different our sense of fear would have been after 9-11 if we knew at the end of 9-11 that there were going to be 100,000 more Americans who died from, that, from terrorism over the course of the rest of 2000. Well, thank you for that, Garrett, and uh, welcome again, everybody. This is the Beacon Salon Speaker Series, and we are with author Garrett Graff, and uh, we're live tonight from Lakefront Television, and now we're going to go ahead and transition into our Q&A session with uh, uh, people on Zoom. Um, do we have any questions uh, tonight? We do. Does your book include interviews with anyone besides first responders and the victims? Yes. So the book pulls together 480 Americans across the country. And it, it, it is sort of as representative as you could uh, assemble. Um, uh, it's everything from school children who were with President Bush in Sarasota at Emma Booker Elementary School uh, to military pilots uh, over the skies of uh, the, the eastern United States uh, to commercial airline pilots themselves and, and flight attendants as they responded around the country. Um, as well as, you know, everyday New Yorkers, uh, everyday people in Washington, people on Capitol Hill, uh, people inside the White House bunker. Um, you know, part of what made this project so interesting was the ability to go out and read all of these different perspectives on that day. And th there were a number of institutions that did a tremendous job uh, amassing archives of oral histories in the wake of 9-11, understanding that these stories would someday be of interest to, uh, to historians. And so I spent about two years for this project uh, going out and collecting those oral history archives with a researcher uh, from the 9-11 Museum named Jenny Pachuki. We found about 5,000 total archived interviews uh, and waded through about 2,000 of them ourselves um, in order to come up with the story that the book tells uh, as America experienced 9-11 morning, night, coast to coast. Another one. Do schools, colleges teach our students about September 11th? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And as I said in my talk, you know, part of what makes this moment so difficult is realizing that a quarter of America no longer remembers 9-11 or was born after it. That what, what you have today is the arrival of Generation Z in American politics, the, the college students at, at Beacon and other campuses across the country who uh, are actually, this is going to be the first election this fall that uh, you will have a significant portion of voters who don't remember 9-11, um, sort of a, a, an incredible change in the way that we think of the American body politic. And so uh, I, I've spent a lot of time trying to research and look at how 9-11 is taught in schools. Um, I actually, uh, I did a, a piece for the anniversary this year where I went out and interviewed uh, a, a score of children who were actually born on 9-11 itself, September 11th, 2001 to talk with them about what it's been like growing up in the shadow of that day in an America that was shaped in ways big and small by that day, but without ever actually remembering the day itself. And the, there were sort of two things that really stood out to me. The first being how little they actually know about 9-11. Um, and then also uh, how little they know about the wars that it spawned. Um, the, you know, they, they have lived every day of their lives with America at war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And for them growing up today, it's basically background noise. You know, they know very little about those wars, why we are there or why we are still there. Great. More questions. Would you explain why you think it's so important for our first time young voters to understand the tragedy of 9-11? Yeah, um, uh, there are sort of a couple of different things that stand out for me. Um, one is that sense of innocence that I spoke about, that uh, you know, for them growing up, uh, they have always known a country that was more fearful and anxious than the country that I grew up in as a child of the 1980s. Um, and uh, that they have, uh, you know, they've never known a time of peace in their, uh, in their lives, but they've also sort of never known the sense of innocence that was lost on 9-11, the sense of vulnerability that began to pervade daily American life. And I think it's really important to try to remember that, uh, that experience, both so that they understand the trauma of the nation that they grew up in, but also in my most optimistic moments, so that we can try to work towards a society that regains some of that innocence if we can. We are here this evening with Garrett Graff, author of The Only Plane in the Sky, An Oral History of 9-11. Garrett, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, when you were writing this book and you, you went through a lot of tr transcribed interviews and uh, you talked with a lot of people, was there anybody that you wish you could have spoken to that you didn't get the opportunity to, to speak to? Yeah, it, it, it's a, a great question, and, and it's one that I thought a lot about in the context of the story. Is like how how do you uh, you know what are the holes in this story that I need to fill? Um, so there's sort of two um, two big ones: um, it, uh, President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Um, Vice President Cheney has spoken pretty significantly about his experience that day. And so there was actually a fair bit of archival material that I was able to draw upon. President Bush much less. And so 
one of the things that I decided in the course of this was that President Bush was only going to appear in this book contemporaneously. So the only place that you see him in the book uh, actually speaking is speaking the words that he spoke on 9-11 and that sort of the rest of his appearance in the book is actually it, it, people reacting to him. More broadly though, part of the challenge of writing an oral history is that you are uh, forced by the very nature of the, the, the project to draw upon people who live. And so on a day that was filled with so much death and so much tragedy, figuring out how to tell the stories of the people who died was something that I spent a lot of time on in the course of this project. And so what I ended up turning to were the voicemails and telephone calls that people had uh, over the course of that day from the hijacked airliners um, to 911 dispatchers, um, from the, the Twin Towers, um, and, and then also in the voices of loved ones and coworkers and, and trying to remember them and capture those experiences in the course of the day. Because one of the things that really does come through in that context, that it, when you sort of think about then versus now, is just how primitive the technologies of 2001 were that you know, we think of in many ways 9-11 as part of our modern life, that in many ways 9-11 is the clearest dividing line that we have between the 20th century and the 21st century. And yet the technologies of that day were actually quite primitive. And so one of the things that I was really haunted by when I was doing this research and thinking about this was how different the experiences that we would have captured from that day would be if they unfolded now, you know, in an age of Twitter, of, uh, of Facebook, uh, of live streamed video, um, you know, we would have had, uh, you know, video from above the impact zone. You know, we would have had probably video from the hijacked airliners itself. Um, and, and so these, uh, these experiences, which are so literally unimaginable to us in 2001, um, we probably would have actually had um, a really clear and horrifying understanding of what those victims' experiences were like um, in, in modern times. More questions, Ron? So there are a lot of conspiracy theories. Uh, the questioner says that one that she's heard about from a friend that in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, that they believe the plane was actually shot down. I mean, any credibility? Are there any conspiracy theories that you give any weight to is the question. Yeah, so I would sort of divide this question. I would parse the question a little bit. Um, I do believe that there is information that is relevant to 9-11 that we don't yet know, that has not been fully released by the government. Um, my own personal questions um, revolve around sort of two issues where I don't think that we know the full truth. Um, one is the involvement of the Saudi government and Saudi officials in supporting and financing the attacks as in supporting the hijackers. The U.S. government has moved to declassify some more information about that just in the last couple of years. Um, and, and I'm not fully convinced that we know the full extent of that now. The other area where I think that there is reason to believe that we don't know the full truth is about the CIA's motivations in the summer of 2001, that, uh, that the CIA was aware that two of the would-be 9-11 hijackers were inside the United States and had ties to Al-Qaeda. And of course, they didn't know at the time what the hijackers were here for but they knew that Khalid al-Idhar and Nawaf al-Hazmi were inside the United States and tied to al-Qaeda 
and they did not tell the FBI that information. Um, and uh, there were some legal reasons for that, um, some of which were fixed after 9-11, um, but I'm not fully sure that we know the full truth about why the CIA didn't uh, share that information in the summer of 2001. To answer the bigger question, though, there are all manner of conspiracy theories about 9-11. Um, it was in many ways the first conspiracy theory of the modern digital age. Um, and, you know, there are sort of two broad uh, buckets of theories, um, what are known as uh, people who believe that the U.S. government let it, it happen on purpose and those who believe that the government made it happen on purpose, that the government actually planned uh, and, and executed at least parts of the attack itself. Um, I, I place uh, zero credence in the idea that the U.S. government had meaningful knowledge of the attacks before 9-11 or in any way participated in it, um, mostly because um, as someone who has covered national security for you know, 15 years or so now, um, conspiracy theories posit a level of competence and success that is not generally evident in any other work that the U.S. government actually does. That in many ways, the story of 9-11 as you dive into it is a story about a government that should have been prepared but wasn't rather than a government that was so sophisticated that it was able to play some role in the attack itself. Now, I do want to sort of, I think it's always worth stopping and, and taking a step back here and also sort of just saying the reason that we should be so troubled by 9-11 conspiracy theories is the extent to which they posit uh, the idea that the U.S. government is complicit uh, or, or in fact actually caused the murder of thousands of U.S. citizens and then covered it up. And that that conspiracy, uh, in order to have been successful, um, presumably would have involved thousands of people from all manner of government agencies, both before, during, and after, uh, none of whom have uh, provided any meaningful leaks ever since um, and were totally fine participating in the death of thousands of their fellow citizens. And, and, I, and I think that that's a really pernicious and troubling view of our government and the people who work in it. And it's one that I have never seen any basis for believing. Uh, more questions, Ron? So Michael would like to know how to get your book. I'm sure that will be covered, but he would love to know. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, it's a great question. The, the book is uh, available wherever and however you read books. Um, you can get it at your local independent bookstore, Barnes & Noble, um, online at Amazon or bookshop.org. Um, it, it's available uh, as an e-reader on your Kindle um, or other e-reader. Um, and it's also, I, I should put in a special plug uh, for the audiobook, um, which I, I think the book is good. The audiobook is great. The, um, the team that put that together, um, it's read by a full cast, 45 different voices, um, an incredible tapestry of, uh, of American voices, um, and it contains actually the original recordings from air traffic control, original speeches from that day. And it's a, it's a really incredible tour de force if you are an audiobook person. Um, and, uh, and actually was named 
the audiobook of the year this year. So uh, you uh, can read it knowing that the experts think it's good too. Great. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, I don't think we have any additional questions right now, so I'll throw one into the mix. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you were talking about the level of sophistication that the uh, United States government would have had to have to pull this off, and it got me thinking also about what you were talking about, again, about uh, the country being in a state of innocence prior to 9-11. Uh, I'm wondering, Garrett, do you think that we have kind of slipped back into this uh, state of um, ignorance, this uh, state of bliss that because nothing has happened in 19 years that we have hardened our security forces enough that um, something like this will never happen again? Uh, so I think the, um, it, there, there's a yes and a no to your answer. Um, the, it, it would be enormously hard for an organization, Al-Qaeda or otherwise, to carry out the type of coordinated, spectacular, uh, multi-venue attack that Al-Qaeda managed to pull off on 9-11. Um, that we have improved our intelligence uh, gathering, um, our, our surveillance capabilities, our counterterrorism capabilities, such that that type of attack would be uh, almost unthinkable uh, today, um, you know, knock on wood, never want to say never, um, but uh, but it's hard to imagine a level of coordination uh, like that succeeding with our capabilities today. Um, what what you have seen instead is sort of the localization of global extremism, and, and what I mean by that is. Um, social media uh, and the internet has turbocharged the ability of extremist groups to spread their ideology. The, uh, and not just, um, by the way, uh, I I Islamic extremism. Um, when you talk to U.S. government officials today, um, they say that the, the terror threat that they are actually most concerned about is white nationalism and white supremacy. That the threat of uh, white supremacists uh, over the last couple of years uh, has grown in, in, in uh, grown to a global level, really, that uh, they had never seen before. That uh, white nationalism, white supremacy has always existed um, in the United States and elsewhere but that it has knitted together into a global ideology in a way where attackers at the local level will reference other attacks uh, around the world. That you saw um, the shooter in Christchurch in that massacre last year uh, cite uh, the church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina as one of his inspirations. And that those types of attacks are, are incredibly hard to prevent because in many ways, uh, and often the case, the, the person has not actually committed a crime until they begin to carry out their attack. That there are not sort of wires that those people would hit in law enforcement or intelligence prior to actually beginning those attacks. And that um, that type of, uh, of sort of low level individual style attack is gonna be something that uh, the United States is probably going to have to live with um, you know, for the foreseeable future. Great, any more questions? We're all done. Well, it looks like the uh, well has run dry this evening, and so I'll uh, put a period on this uh, event tonight. And I want to thank you, Garrett, for uh, joining us live this evening to uh, talk about this event. And we want to thank you most of all for the remarkable work you have done on this remarkable book, um, helping us to remember and never forget this tragic episode in our American history. Once again, 
thank you for joining us, Garrett. And uh, viewers out there, again, I uh, invite you to visit Porch lightbooks.com and pick up a copy of uh, Garrett's book. Uh, they're offering 20% off the uh, regular price. That's a good deal and it's a great book. So please do uh, uh, make your trip to that uh, website. Thank you very much for watching tonight um, the Beacon Salon speaker series. Uh, I want to thank before we go uh, Lakefront Television's production team for putting this together and Mr. Ron Red for his behind the scenes IT work and for fielding the questions from Zoom. And I want to invite you to come back next month on October 13th when we have our next Beacon Salon speaker series event. Uh, it features former editorial cartoonist Glenn Marty Stein in his presentation, Recollections of an Editorial Cartoonist. For the Beacon Salon Speaker Series, I'm Daryl Owens. Thank you for joining us, and good night.